So no mic, so you guys, you can, this echoes pretty well in here. So yeah, I was in, you know, first of all, it's, it's an honor to follow the esteemed uh, philosopher Jack Bowen, um, a legend. Uh, not just a great goalkeeper, but a great philosopher. Uh, as I told him earlier, I actually read all of his stuff um, all the time. I, I love it. I think it's great. Um, so, yeah, just straight off a week training camp in, in Colorado Springs, we took uh, 20 of our, you know, supposed best athletes to Colorado Springs at altitude. Uh, altitude is uh, pretty interesting. Uh, the first few days were, were a little rough, uh, obviously, for, for the athletes. I think we're at 6,700 feet, um, but it's, uh, it was a great way to kind of end our, our fall season uh, training. And now, just to give you a little update on our team, we're, we, got a, we have a very young team. I think our average age is 20, um, just a little bit over 20. We were actually the second youngest team in the world. Uh, I think many people th think of us as kind of a bunch of old geezers in a lot of ways, but uh, maybe in the last Olympics, this, this time around, we are super young. Uh, Russia was the only team that was younger than us, and uh, for that reason, we have uh, like three high school kids that are part of our program. We got a bunch of collegiate athletes, and then we have some post grads uh, that are training and, and kind of preparing to qualify for the Olympics, and then hopefully uh, get the opportunity to play play in Olympic games. But it's it's an honor to be here. I, I always enjoy um, talking to peers, uh, and I think the first thing I'll say is that. Uh, for me, it, it, you know, I, I've had certainly, I think uh, if you look at the results, I've had a lot of success, but there's so much that goes into it, and there's so many people that, that go into it uh, to make that success happen. Um, I'm going to share my ideas um, and kind of my philosophies, but by no means is my ideas, my philosophy have to be your philosophy. I think it's important that we all kind of create our own. Um, I think that's the one nice thing that I've done in my career. I've taken stuff that I've liked from certain people and I've used it um, with my teams and I've taken stuff I don't like and I make sure I don't use it. Um, and when John asked me to speak about you know, building a winning culture, it was a uh, you know, no-brainer. Um, the first thing I think we have to do, actually, is kind of define winning and culture. Because if that's really what I'm going to talk about, well then, I, th this is, in, in my opinion, this is the definition. This is my own personal definition. Culture is a consistent set of behaviors and beliefs. Right? Kind of a, the way you do things on a, on a daily basis. And then winning is, it's not, for me, it's not winning a championship or winning a gold medal or winning an NC2A championship like someone's going to do this weekend, it's about maximizing your potential, right? And you can't have the second one without the first one, right? Culture comes first. We, you know, winning comes second. Maximizing your potential comes, comes second. So, you know, I, I just, I took my own liberty here and I've, I've changed presentation. Sorry, John. I know the, the, the building is a winning, building a winning culture is sexy. It's what everyone wants, right? Everyone wants to, you know, how, how do you win the gold medal? How do you win the championship? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you and to bore you, but this is really what it's about. It's building a set of behaviors and beliefs that maximize potential. We don't talk about winning a gold medal, okay? Swear to God, we don't talk about it. We talk about this stuff. We talk about how we, how we want to do it. And anytime you're going through and you're beginning a process, whether it's you're beginning a four-year cycle for us or a year with your high school team or your college team or whatever, or just a, your, your season, I think the very first thing that you have to do, actually, I'm, I'm one step ahead here. So everyone know this, this man? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a big Bay Area sports fan. I know, Jack, might, you might appreciate that now, hopefully. You've gotten rid of the San Diego stuff. Um, but Bill Walsh, right, three-time Super Bowl champion with, with the Niners, I think he said it best going back to the behaviors, right? Champions behave like champions before they actually are champions. They behave like champions. It doesn't just, obviously, you don't just show up one day or one month or one week. You do it over a period of 
time. When you talk about, you know, I spoke to our team last night about, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, what does it take to make it into a Hall of Fame? There's so, certain athletes that are talented enough to make it into a Hall of Fame, certain teams maybe that are talented enough to make it to a Hall of Fame, certain coaches that are talented enough to make it to a Hall of Fame. Not everyone gets that opportunity, but all Hall of Famers, at least in our country, all Hall of Famers have something in common. And that's something in common is they were great, not just for one season, one day, one tournament, two years, three years. If you're in a Hall of Fame, it's because you were good for a long period of time. You had sustained excellence. And the only way you can have sustained excellence is if you think about those behaviors and those beliefs first. So... Whenever I go through a process or season, and I'll kind of relate it to this, this quad, and actually I had this talk with, part of this talk with my team yesterday, the first thing you got to do is you got to begin with the end in mind. I right? begin with the end in mind. So for us and for me, and I do this exercise also just with my team, not just with myself individually, but we think about at the end of the day, so when we're in beautiful Rio de Janeiro, okay, it's a little bit chaotic, chaotic there. I was actually just there a couple of weeks ago. It's a little crazy, um, but it's absolutely gorgeous. When we're there and we're at the Olympic Games, what do we want that to look like? How do we want to be playing? How do we want to be acting? How do we want to be treating each other? What is our mental approach? What is our tactical approach? What do, do we want it to look like at the end of the day? That's where you have to start. If you don't know where you want to go, then I don't know how the hell you're going to get there. You've got to know where you want to go. So begin with the end in mind. And when I think about like beginning with the end in mind, the first thing, and this goes ahead of tactics, ahead of conditioning, it's identifying core values. Identifying core values. And core values are essentially the same thing, behaviors. How you want to train, how you want to behave, how you want to treat each other. What do you want your team to look like? What do you want to look like? You should, right? for me, even my staff, we have a set of like five core values Okay, for this past, actually, this past year, we talked about five things that we really, we wanted to try to live by. It's not certain six on five or this. So we get to that, obviously, okay? But it's, hey, what do we want to do? We want to inspire. We want to teach, right? right? It always starts with identifying core values. Talk about... <clears throat> Been building that culture that we're talking about. So we got the vision, right? Begin with the end in mind. So we're thinking about where we want to go. And now we have to obviously be able to communicate it. This sounds simple. And this is, this is much more difficult than it is, than it sounds. And this is something that I, I literally have to remind myself every single day. Because I think all of us as coaches, we have, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, our, our job. It's, um, it can be the most rewarding thing in the world. Um, I think we're all probably here in this room because we love it and we're very enthusiastic. But at the same time, we can't ever get it out of our minds, right? It's like a 20, you're thinking about it 24-7, right? I don't think my wife enjoys it too much right, at certain times because I can't stop thinking about it. But... The hard thing to do sometimes is communicating what we're thinking to our team. How the heck are we going to get our team, or your team, my team, to follow kind of where we want to be at the end if we can't communicate it? We have to communicate it. I throw this picture up there because when I took over in uh, 2009 of, of the team, we, we had, everyone knows Brenda Villa, right? I and mean, we had a three-time Olympian, the player of the decade, um, and Brenda and I, you know, I'm coming in, new young coach, changing some things, and Brenda and I, we didn't necessarily hit it off in the beginning. You know, we butted heads, right? 
I had kind of my way, she had her, her way, but the one thing and I realized I didn't do a very good job of within the first year, and the first, especially the first six months, is communicating what I was thinking. I came in and this is how we're going to do it, this, 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 and you just do it, okay? This is, I'm the coach, you're just going to do it. Well, if you really think about it, okay, if you really want them to get where you're thinking you want to get, well, you have to communicate it. And I, I honestly, I still struggle with this, and I have to remind myself, again, every single day about communicating to my athletes what I want it to look like, what I want that day to look like, what I want the week to look like, what I want the month, what I want the whole cycle, what I want that season to look like. When you talk about building teams, teams, <coughs> building teams is about building relationships. Relationships. You can't build a team without building relationships. And how do you build relationships? It takes time. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes time outside of the two hours or three hours or an hour and a half you have in practice every day. It takes time. If you have a 20-person roster, you need to spend time with everyone. You need to build relationships. When you build relationships, there's a ton of things. This is our team just actually a few days ago um, at Colorado Springs at the Garden of the Gods. I don't know if any of you have been there. It's a pretty neat, neat place. That's Pike. Pike's Peak in the background, uh, almost 15,000 feet. I told them this week we plan to hike, hike it in, uh, in September, next September. They're pretty stoked about that. No. Um, there's plenty of things that, can, that, that you benefit from when you're building relationships. Obviously, you're building a kind of a cohesive team, but you build respect. Okay. We can't move forward as a team unless we have some type of respect for one another, no matter our differences. Build trust, right? How are they going to trust me if I have no personal relationship with them? It's not, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You build trust by building the relationship first. And then adaptability. So in my opinion, when you build... When you build relationships, the first thing that comes and you benefit from is just open communication, open and honest and direct communication. And when you have that, that open line of communication, then you create an environment in which everyone is learning from each other all the time. You're not just learning from one person, you're learning from each other all the time. And you're learning in difficult situations and you're ready to adapt. And if, if you respect, you build that relationship, you earn the respect, the trust, you communicate, and then all of a sudden you're able to adapt to certain situations that happen in the water. If you don't have a relationship with the people that you're playing with, and this is not just coach to player, this is also player to player, then how are you supposed to, in the most intense moment, at least for us, in a semifinal game of the Olympic Games, when things aren't, aren't going too well, how are you supposed to be able to communicate, look at each other in the eye and kind of communicate and trust the people next to you? It starts with building a relationship. I don't know if you guys have heard the quote, but athletes don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And some will say that that's just for women. Okay, I call bullshit. This is on camera, sorry. <laughs> it's men and women. Everyone likes to be cared about, okay? Everyone likes to be cared about. And the only, we, only way you can show that you care is by actually taking interest in their lives, by building that relationship, even outside of water polo. So this is Maggie Steffens. Uh, she was just awarded the uh, Player of the World, 2014 Player of the World. Uh, plays at Stanford, NC2A champion at Stanford. Uh, Player of the World in 2012, right, MVP. 
Olympic Games, scored 20, 26 goals. The Olympic Games set a new record. Not just 26 goals, or maybe, tw I forget how many. I think it was like 23 goals. It was like something like 23 goals out of 26 shots. It's like 89% or something like that. James would probably rattle it off the top, <laughs> top of his head. So this is, this is huge. This is huge. I can't emphasize this enough. And it depends on your team and who you have, and you have to know kind of who your leaders are. Identifying and nurturing your leaders. And you need to spend time doing this. You need to spend time. I hope all of you do. And if you don't, I really highly recommend it. So anytime I go into a team, I, I identify, okay, who are our best leaders? I don't care if they're even going back to college years. I don't care if you're freshmen, sophomores. I, in fact, you better get a freshman in there. If you have, you need to teach them. You can't wait until they're seniors. When I was back at UCLA, I always tried to make an emphasis on, hey, who's the freshman? Who's the freshman that uh, has potential to be a great leader? Let's get, let's get to him now or her now. Let's work on the, their leadership. Who's the junior? Who's the sophomore? Who's the senior? Hey, this is important because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, hey, they listen to us as coaches, certainly. But I remember when I played, and I respect my coaches a ton. But I, always, I think I always listen to my teammates a little bit more, especially the leaders. So knowing, as a coach, knowing that the rest of the team is going to listen to the leaders, then we have to communicate our vision, identify the leaders, and communicate that vision to the leaders of our team. Maggie has turned into, she's one of the best leaders I've ever seen in my life. She's an incredible leader. If you ever get a chance to watch her play, don't watch and you'll notice she doesn't actually score a ton. She makes everyone around her better. And for me, it's like she's like my, my point guard in a lot of ways, right? If you relate it to basketball. Right? Someone who can communicate the vision, the values, how we want to play, what we want it to look like. And the one nice thing it actually does for us as coaches is it takes some pressure off us, to be honest. I think the hard thing we struggle with is, hey, this is a goldfish, right? I think we usually think of goldfish, we think of them as like uh, maybe like five inches, maybe six inches. You know what happens when you take a goldfish out of that, that little bowl? and you put it in the right environment, and you kind of let it flourish, you know how big a goldfish can get? Does anyone want to guess? A foot and a half. Goldfish can get a, f a foot and a half. So what I'm saying is, at, at, when you have that special leader, the one thing that you have to do, talk about building the, the right culture. And if you don't, you don't, okay? And it's not always there. It's not always the perfect situation. But you have to relinquish a little bit of control. It's tough for us coaches sometimes to relinquish a little bit of control. We're kind of control freaks, right? We like things done. I, I struggle with it all the time as well. We like things done a certain way, but if you really want the best for your team and you want to create that winning culture, we're not in the pool playing. So again, when you get in those moments, they can be looking at you. The reality is they're not looking at you in the big moments. They're looking at their teammates. They have the biggest influence. So we need to spend time identifying and nurturing our leaders. I think this one's obviously pretty simple. I think it's a great thing about being, uh, being an American, in my opinion. This kind of comes natural. This is the way we do it. We compete. We get after it. You know, but it's important that we put ourselves, we, we put our teams, and we put our individuals in just a very competitive environment where they're pushing each other and competing. 
think John Wooden said it, one of my idols, John Wooden said it best, and he always talked about what his, who his best friend was. His best friend was the, the end of the bench. Right? If someone's not doing there, well, then you can go hang out with your best friend there at the, at the end, end of the bench. Constantly trying to push each other. Right? I think one of the reasons why we've been successful, and I think uh, we're fortunate, we have, uh, I think I have a, a big wide pool to choose from, and, and we, we use that, we emphasize that, to use it as our advantage. So when we have 20 athletes in a camp and they're fighting for 13 spots, you can imagine it's, it's competitive. It's obviously, sometimes it can be a little bit more difficult when you, certain players know that they have a, they have a shot or they're, they're in this position, but you need to be creative to find ways to make sure things are competitive and they know that their spot isn't given to them. Complacency is what we, we always want to revert back to complacency. It's just natural for us. So love the details. I think this is just about, it's about the small things, right? It's about the small behaviors and the little things that we do every day that lead to big success. This is, and this is kind of where my mind is. So this is the, the Pan American Games in 2011. Uh, we're playing Canada in the gold medal final. Winner gets a bid to the Olympic Games, right? So pretty big deal. Um, we were down the whole game. We come back, roaring come back. We score with, I don't know, 30-something seconds left to, to tie the game at, at seven. Canada comes down their possession, and they earn a penalty with about, I think it was either five or eight seconds left. Tie game. Their best shooter and best player, who's already scored five goals, steps, steps up to the plate to score the game, ultimately to, to win it, right? To give them a berth to go to the Olympic Games. And Betsy comes out of the goal and blocks it. We were, we're, we're literally this, this close to, we won the gold medal. I don't, I don't know if you guys remember that. We won the gold medal, but we almost, we almost didn't get there. We're this close to not getting there. I told our team the other day, in the Olympic Games, for us, and it, you know, again, every situation is different. Olympic Games, in 2008 Olympic Games, the six games that were advancement games, so the quarterfinals, the semifinals, and it was a little different format than, than it is now, and then the gold medal and then the, the bronze medal, out of the six games, all six games were won by one goal. One goal. And out of those six, two of them went into overtime. In 2012, <clears throat> there was eight qualifying games or advancement games or medal games. And six out of those eight games were a one or two goal difference. Ironically, the only game, one of the only games that was our gold medal final. But all the others were decided by one or two goals. Two of them went into overtime, one went into a shootout. So you're talking about, I mean, we're, we're talking about little things that make a difference. Little tiny things. And our philosophy and my philosophy is we're going to love the details. I think, and I'll touch on this later, but I think a lot of coaches that I see do the same stuff. I think sometimes we a little overdo it with our our tactics. Maybe you heard my colleague Dehan talk about that a little bit. The difference is the coach that emphasizes the details, the tiny little things that make the big difference. That's the difference. The tiny little things that make the big difference. And you gotta love them. The, my players hate them at times. I mean, I fought with them all fall about this. 
because they don't want to do the fundamental. They want to play. They just want to play. Okay? But, but our goal is we're not going to do it just until we get it right. We're going to do it until we can't get it wrong. That's the goal. And the only way we can do that is by loving, embracing, loving and embracing the details, the tiny things that make a big difference. One of the things I worry about, this is personal, on a personal level, one of the things I worry about this team that I have right now is I, I, don't, I don't think we appreciate the details. I told them that last night. I had a team in the past with uh, Brenda Villa and a Heather Petrie. You know why they appreciate the details? Because they went to three Olympic Games and they came this close every single time to reaching their goal. Darn right they appreciate the details. Because they know it can be taken from them like that. It's not an easy thing to convey to our athletes. It's not. I struggle with it. They struggle with it. But it's something we need to work on. Everyone's accountable. Okay? Everyone's accountable. We're all in this together. This is a picture of our team in the semifinal, right after the semifinal against Australia. Um, we're all in it together. Everyone's a teammate. Coaches, medical staff, psychologists, athletes, backup goalie. We're all in this together and we're all accountable. I think everyone knows, you know, my big mistake, right? It's amazing. It's, it's really stupid, okay? But, you know, th this, this, we, we have a thing with our team. We're, we're all responsible. If we weren't all responsible, then this, the team never would have won. It would have been so easy in this moment. Okay? The coach basically is ruining your chance to go to the gold medal game. It would be so easy in this moment if you really think about it. If you're a player and you're, you really think you're, you're, the game is won, and you're going to go play for a gold medal game, and then your coach up there does this stupid mistake. But if we didn't have this philosophy of, like, oh, we're all accountable, it would have been so easy for them to just to point fingers at me. And when they point fingers at me, where is it taking their attention? Away from the game. Away from what they need to do to be successful. We can't be afraid to say, we screwed up. It's the first thing I said to the team when they came over after I made that mistake. Hey, we screwed up. And you know what? We're not going to let some stupid mistake by your dumb coach affect the outcome of this game. It's over. It's done. Time to move on. We're in this together. Coaches included. Okay, Barry, a sports fan. Some of you Bay Area folks will appreciate it. Bruce Bochy. Actually, some of you Padre fans are probably pissed because he's, he left the Padres and he's been uh, really successful. Three World Series champions. If you, if you watched and you follow baseball at all, everyone always talks about Bruce Bochy and they go, oh man, this guy is a genius in how he handles his bullpen. Who he puts in when starting when to take out the starting pitcher, what reliever to bring in, and I know James will probably argue, me, argue with me a little bit, certainly there's statistics involved in, in that, that he follows. But that's not the genius of Bruce Bochy. You know what the genius of Bruce Bochy is? Is he being consistent. The genius is the work that he did long before that move when he decided to bring the left-hander in from the bullpen to come in for the right-hander, and this left-hander ultimately gets the big out in the World Series. It's not that move. I actually even wrote him an email. I had to write him an email after the Giants, because I'm a big Giants fan. I had to write him an email to tell him this. Because I think everyone in the media would just kept talking about, oh, you, this genius, he's making these moves. But you, you're missing the work. You're missing the real work. And I think for us, with coaches, you, know, you guys, it starts with us. 
And I'm not saying I'm perfect. By no means am I perfect. I, I, I have to work, so, I have to get so much better than I am not now. But I think all the time about how can I expect my athlete to be a certain way if I can't be the certain way? Every day. Leaders don't show up every once in a while. Every once in a while. If you're going to be a leader, and we as coaches, we're leaders. If you're going to be a leader, you've got to do it every day. Every day. It's like putting change, putting money in your pocket. You're, you're trying to build the trust and respect of your team. The only way to do that is by being consistent. Every time you veer away from your, your team's core values or kind of where you want to go or your vision or you do something that you wouldn't like your athletes to do, then we're taking money, we're literally taking money out of our pocket. We're taking, which is trust and respect, we're taking it out of our pocket and we're throwing it away. And now we've got to work that much harder to get it, get it back. We can't forget this every day. How we behave, our behaviors, how we behave, it's everything. It's everything. Again, sometimes I think we think too much about tactics and this and that. There's a lot of people doing the same stuff. It's the people who love the details. It's the people who are consistent. Those are the people that are successful. <coughs> so my athletes hadn't heard the story of the pig and the chicken. I don't know if you guys have heard the story of the pig and the chicken walking down the street. And the chicken says to the pig, hey, how about we, we start a restaurant? Let's go into business together, and the pig says, okay, you know, what, what do you want to call the restaurant? And the chicken says back, well, let's call it ham and eggs, right? Ham and eggs, into it. And the pig looks at the chicken and goes, no, I don't want to join because you're just going to be involved in this process, and I'm going to be committed. Right? The pig is sacrificing his life. The chicken is just dropping an egg. So for us, we, we talk about, and this goes along with being consistent, I think, we talk about building this, this culture of behaviors right, and beliefs that, that we want to follow by. We obviously, we have to be consistent, but then we have to commit, and we have to commit completely to the process. We have to immerse ourselves passionately, insanely passionately into the, into the process. And if we don't, again, we can't expect our athletes to. So maybe not the, the sexy stuff people want to hear sometimes, um, but stuff that, that I truly believe is uh, important to, to building a successful culture. Because, again, I think for me, it's culture's where it begins. Culture's where it begins. You find a good culture, and that's why it's important, you know, for, for me, it's always important. One of the most important things I do is finding good assistant coaches. Because if you find a good assistant, you have to share the same values, same core values, the same beliefs. And that's the beginning of the culture. And then, obviously, communicating. But that's where, where it also... If you want success, it's about starting with culture.